Well, thank you, Chris, for joining. Chris Borgia, I'm interviewing today. My name's Thomas Keegan uh, with libertarianprogressive.com. And um, Chris Borgia is running for the U.S. Senate in Florida as uh, no party affiliation. Uh, he has qualified, and I would like to do an introduction today or introduce an interview uh, to go over some issues and see if um, this is uh, candidates that you might want to look into, uh, support, et cetera. And so, Chris, looking at your website, that's the first place I looked to find out some more information about you. I went um, and looked at the home page a little bit. I went to, right to the issues and policy positions. But just first off, real quick, um, there is a, a meet Chris on here, and I think it would be appropriate to, to ask, um, you know, some of your previous backgrounds, what office, you, you know, what, what you hope to accomplish, what drives you, what um, keeps you up at night, or waking up early, Chris. And thank you very much for doing this interview and being accessible like this. I appreciate it. And by the way, today's date is Friday, June the 15th, 2012. And thank you, Chris. Well, thank you, Thomas, for your interest in this and trying to get uh, coverage for candidates who otherwise don't get a lot of coverage, especially as we kick this campaign off. Being an independent as I am without the party structure, uh, I want to thank you for, A, inviting me to this interview, and B, uh, being a passionate citizen concerned with the future of this country and trying to highlight candidates like myself who share that similar concern. As uh, you indicated, my name is Chris Borgia. I'm running for U.S. Senate as an independent here in the state of Florida. I have no political experience. That is to say that I have not ever attempted to run, nor have I worked in an environment of politics. I do have a political science degree from the University of Florida, so I did study it. And I've been very, very interested in politics for a lot of years. In that process uh, of learning and listening and growing and trying to figure out which ideologies, which parties, which issues interest me, you get passionate about this stuff because you, along the way you learn that people aren't serving the American interest, they're serving, unfortunately, the ideological interest, the think tank interest, the party interest, their own self-interest. So I got excited, and I continue to get excited day in and day out as I watch the news, as I listen to voters out there on the campaign trail saying they want something different, so that's what I'm doing. I'm offering myself as an option that is different from your Republican or Democrat, your typical party candidate. We'll talk about some of the things that distinguish me, I'm sure, later in the interview, but to follow up on the question you just asked about my background, Meet Chris is, uh, is online, and it's something you could read. It's just a short story yeah, well, outlining some of my... Was, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah, we see here you um, have a BA from the University of Florida. Um, you're an Iraq War veteran, and... Um, uh, you know, you're born in Fort Lauderdale, so also a Florida native. So that's yeah, Florida native. Went to K through 12 uh, public education as well as public uh, college, and uh, in the process, I aspired for some things when I was younger to include music making and acting and publishing. So uh, at no point was life ever boring. But uh, as someone who's done a lot of things as an individual, trying to aspire for these types of things, I'm realizing now as I get older and want to do better things for something outside of my own little world, that is our economy, our national security, government in general, but I need, I need help, I need support. And getting this campaign off the ground with the support of friends and family has been great. And working in the military and having seen what happens when people come together to accomplish something, it's, uh, it's inspiring. So I'm looking forward to having more people join on and help out. So it's not just a, uh, one man and his friends and family and a few supporters, but hopefully a movement to say, we want something better out of our leaders in Washington. Well, I think definitely someone that sounds credible and, um, and qualified, uh, that's for sure. And now, one of the first things I looked at on the website was the issues. I'm someone who always um, believes that, uh, you know, that's the one, one thing I want to know about a candidate is where they stand. And I'm sure a lot of other folks would too. Um, so some of the bigger issues, um, just uh, like the budget, foreign policy, trade, taxes, uh, civil liberties. How about, what do you think about the budget? I think there's a lot of concern, um, no matter where you stand in your political spectrum on, on this budget that we have. Do you have any opinions on the budgets? The budget is one of my top three issues. So when you go to my issues page, you will inevitably see the things that concern me and the budget and my idea to refresh the budget, as well as refresh Congress and refresh the tax code, are my top three. So yes, I have a lot of ideas what we need to do the budget. They're not my own ideas, and that's the beautiful thing about someone like me. I don't belong to a party. I'm not going to tell you the talking points that my party tell me I need to tell you. I'm going to tell you what smart people are telling me. I'm not in these debates. 
I haven't been in the boardroom. I haven't been listening to uh, every minute of C-SPAN for the last 30 years to know as much as the knowledge that currently exists in Congress. So what do I have? I have a desire to listen to smart people, tell me what the solutions are, listen to them, watch them, read them, come up with my own analysis, and I'd, I'd have to say that restoring America's future, that plan is the plan that I back, nearly 100%, as well as the uh, nonpartisan group that Obama put together to try to address our, our budget. So my, my approach when it comes to the budget is to listen to smart people, people who are telling us that we're spending too much and we need to cut back our spending. So when we have an approach that says cut back our spending by about 50% of all the cutbacks to include 38% of an upgrade in uh, our tax uh, expenditures, that is to say get money coming in by flattening out the tax code, by leveling the playing field and making sure there are no tax expenditures out there that people are taking advantage of, that in combination with cutting back spending and a little bit of extra growth in the economy, we can get where we need to go with the budget. And again, it comes down to the listening to smart people. I appreciate um, you know the open mindedness for ideas, and there's a lot of ideas out there, probably on the on, on the bookshelves somewhere, um, that where we could streamline our budgets. And I see a lot of good ideas that you had in here. Um, now, there's some of the big ones, and this kind of goes into foreign policy uh, as as well. I mean, a lot of people say it's going to be Social Security, Medicare, and um, and, and the military. Um, that's are the big three things with our budget. Of course, there's a lot of earmark spending and, and things like that. And also, if you saw a budget you didn't like, would you be willing to um, vote against uh, passing that budget? Well, that's an interesting question. You, you, have, uh, you, have, you, you propose the idea that we spent a lot of money on defense, and as someone who was in the military, as an officer in the Army, and served, saw a lot of waste. I would agree we could cut back on a lot of things to include defense. Nothing should be off the table. So, uh, yes, uh, cutting back spending on all fronts, no sacred cows, you don't defend your interest groups. You don't just do the things that benefit you and your constituents alone. You do the things that benefit America. And unfortunately, that means we all sacrifice. We all get to have to get a little cut here and there. Now, to your second question, or at least the notion of how I would vote, that's important, right? You want to make sure that you're going to send someone to Washington, D.C. to represent the interests of you, and hopefully if you're of my mindset, all Americans, and not you because you're white, black, or Hispanic, not you because you're liberal or conservative, not you because you're Republican or Democrat, rich or old, insured, uninsured, not you as the individual, but you as the American. And I have to say that Americans don't want to see gridlock and games. They want to see our leaders come together and offer solutions. So would I vote for something? There's so many variables in place to determine whether I would vote for something, but the bottom line is where does Chris stand? And when he does vote, he's going to stand with you and the American people in the U.S. Constitution. If that means sometimes voting for something that I don't agree 100 percent, yes, we need progress out of this Congress. We don't need good luck and games. We don't need what we're getting with this failed leadership. So it's very difficult to answer questions like, would you vote for? Because, again, the variable seems so immense. Yeah, Chris, and then that's, given the circumstances, that's a good answer. That's a good answer. I'm just on um, – is there any legislation you could imagine, not any specifically that um, you could say you would be, I guess, of course, you would be willing to vote against if it came to it, per se? I mean, it's... Sure, yeah. sure. I mean, my approach to good leadership is not so much drawing lines and saying, I will not cross this line, but drawing boundaries. So there's gray area in almost every aspect uh, of government, and there should be, because there's a lot of gray area out there in America that says we're not all of one mindset or philosophy. We are a mixture of people. We have to serve everybody. And I believe uh, that it's important to reach conclusions, get laws out there that make uh, the economy work and our security uh, remain as, as strong and, and, and uh, defensive as possible. So, yes, there are things I, I would possibly, if put on the table, would say, no, we can't do that. We can't, we can't raise taxes to 40%, 45%. We're not going to go back to, excuse me, in South Florida right now, we have a serious storm coming ahead. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, if you, want to, if you want to ask specific questions, I'll address them, but uh, in an umbrella, all encompassing kind of questions, it'd be kind of hard to say. And, uh, so um, now, as far as foreign policy goes, I mean, it sounds like you stand with a lot of the American people. Um, if you look at recent polls, most people do um, want us to get out of Afghanistan. Most people wanted to go after Osama bin Laden and um, Al Qaeda. Um, most people probably didn't think that how we handled uh, everything was good or, or with Iraq. Um, a lot of people agree now that um, that has been a big expenditure and um, and we're you know, they say bombing bridges overseas so we can rebuild them while we have 
you know, bridges over here in this country that, uh, you know, probably le need uh, more fixing first. So um, I think uh, that's not something that, uh, you, you know, people no longer need to be shy away from because that's where the people stand. You can have good defense without um, as much uh, military spending, per se. I agree. Okay, and um, now on trade, uh, what do you think about, um, like, uh, what should be our policy on trade or, or just basically dealing with other countries? Um, and um, and did, do you have an opinion on, on NAFTA at all, sir? Free trade agreements are very interesting beasts because you have a lot of uh, incentives by both uh, us and the people we're doing trade with to get whatever's in our own best interest, right? So the idea, of course, is to have these free tra trade agreements uh, serve the American interest, the American people, the American economy. And when you take a look at some concepts in trade like comparative advantage that suggest that we all benefit when we allow the country or countries or societies that make products and goods and services cheaper than we can, let them do it. But it was no more than an hour ago that I was in a bakery talking to a woman who made clothing for kids and she makes it in America and she can't compete and her business might be going down after 20 years of, of business. So you have people out there who want to see trade policy that's fair, not just free. And it's an interesting dynamic to have to draw between, to say which side are you going to be on. I'm of the mindset that the freer the better, but at the same time, if we're ever in a situation where we're losing jobs at a record pace as we are now, we, we need to start looking into making sure that our partners are also free in their trade to us and from us about the tariffs. So I would throw out the bat, I'm definitely someone who supports free trade and wants to see more uh, free trade. Yeah, and but we I know that nations that trade together, uh, you know, fight less often with each other too. So it is a good thing, but I think a lot of uh, people are on the uh, yeah, fairness yeah. too. I mean, there's definitely, it sounds like it's not even fair. It sounds like we're getting the, um, you know, the bad end of the bargain on, on a lot of these deals, it seems like. Um, it, yeah, it's, it's interesting to look at. And you, you just put something out there that a lot of people don't think about. That's the interdependence. The idea that free trade kind of leads to a, a connection with the other people we're doing business with. So in the event that things get hostile, it's too costly to go to war. And that's a good thing. We don't want to go to war with people. And free trade enables those types of relationships that prevent uh, easily uh, building up a hostility and ultimately putting a, 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 our defense uh, out there. And that's, yeah, that's would... an expense. And there's trade-offs. There's trade-offs to everything we do. I'd personally say, I, I don't know, I'll skip to, I'll go to the next question, but I think we probably could influence the Middle East a lot more by trading with them, uh, uh, possibly, and so, um, but that's just a thought. So civil liberties, do you have, um, or do you have any feelings on civil liberties um, in the 21st century? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, civil liberties are obviously important to a lot of people who follow what's been going on in government, and what is government if not a deviation from liberty? So the idea that we have natural rights and we're free to choose and free markets and free individuals in our own personal life, uh, that gets kind of, uh, in government at least, in, in, in one direction or another, it gets distorted. You either can, in my, the way I look at it, is you have Republicans or conservatives who when they deviate from liberty, you know, or natural rights, they do so in order to promote an order, right? They want order in society. And then liberals or uh, Democrats do it for equality. They want to make sure that we maximize equal outcomes. And the idea that you should be deviating at all from liberty, I, I suggest we should do that only in rare circumstances. So you name a civil liberty, and I'm going to tell you we should do everything in, in our power as a, as a society, and in my case, someone running for public office, as a potential public official uh, who will be crafting these laws, to leave freedom and choice, maximum freedom and choice as possible, to all citizens. And at no point in the process should you remove that freedom or that choice unless it harms others. That, that's pretty much my litmus test for supporting civil liberties. That's pretty much the golden rule there. Um, and uh, that's good to hear, Chris. Um, I think that's a really important issue. Um, and uh, now some of the um, big, big kind of hot button issues, I, I think, um, like what about that um, the, the individual mandates. Uh, if, if there is a way we could um, get rid of the individual mandates, and it might be taken care of by the Supreme Court anyways, but um, uh, do you have any opinions on an individual mandates? Uh, do you think the health care reforms could have been um, done without one possibly? 
I'm sure your audience probably knows what the individual mandate is, but just in brief, that is the government telling you you need to purchase something, and in this case, insurance, uh, for your health care needs. And if you don't, they're going to fine you. And that is something at the Supreme Court and something that we'll see here, I believe, at the end of the month, what they decide on. But regardless, it goes back to the idea of choice and freedom we just talked about. I do not support that. I do not support the idea that government can impose its will on you to do something that you would otherwise not do. And I'm sure there are lots of examples where they do that in the name of security, in the name of uh, a lot of things, but unfortunately in the name of health, I believe that's a personal right and a per personal choice that the federal government should not impose its will on. Now, when you ask me, should the states do it? Hey, let the states do whatever they want. You, you want to you, you have more competition in the marketplace? You want to ask people to, uh, to contribute to a single-payer system or, or whatever health care solution you think is best for your state? I, I'm not someone who's going to get in the way or tell the states they can or cannot do something. But the federal government, I don't think should at all. Uh, so it's more competition and simplicity. And everything the government does is pretty much my motto. Competition and simplicity in healthcare means that you allow for competition. And if that means buying insurance across state lines, or if that means creating a single-payer system to compete with insurance, great. Okay. So uh, it's a complicated issue, and a lot of people have a lot of strong emotions on it. I'm sure we could spend an hour talking about that alone. Great. But, great. Uh, what else you got? Yeah, no, I, actually, I, well, I was, I'm going to feel good having a choice um, this November of someone that is against the individual mandates um, unlike Bill Nelson, who felt like, um, you know, we could impose that even when he tried to get that special deal for some people in Florida, but um, still had an individual mandate. And unlike the Republican who says that they're against it, but I think it was the Republican platform like in the 90s um, where they introduced, they're the first people who introduced the individual mandate. So I don't know how sincere that would be. So having an independent who's against the individual mandates because they understand um, where the electric is coming from, I think is going to be very important. Um, uh, uh, comparative to the other two uh, candidates I'll probably end up there and now another issue is um, I don't think it's a hot button issue yet but I think it should be it's called in something you're proposing here it's called the sunset clause and I haven't I heard a little bit more murmurings about it in some legislative bodies here and there in some states but not not, not as much as it could be used for can you explain I think this could this one um, issue it seems to me could cure a lot, a lot of uh, uh, bad laws and ills. Uh, can, can you explain your uh, what? What is this? Um, this legislation, I suppose, that you'll uh, champion and uh, introduce. Well, yes, uh, I would love to take the opportunity to do it. But before I do, I'll take the opportunity to tell you what I think is even more impactful in the name of refreshing Congress and the idea of getting better law and legislation. Then I'll lead up to what I think is a great idea, the one you just suggested that uh, we talk about, which is the sunset cloud. Uh, first and foremost, I think our voting system, unfortunately, the plurality voting, the, the caveman style voting where you check one block and that's it, is not as expressive as it can be, and it's not as expressive that would allow us to get the candidates, at least in my case, an independent or someone on line with party, to have much of a shot at all. So put, people put me in office and uh, they put their faith in me. That's my number one goal, to champion reform that allows for more public servants to get on the ballot and into Washington to serve you. And score voting does just that by giving the opportunity to rank each candidate on the ballot zero to ten. That reform alone will give us the leadership we need for everything else that we can possibly address in this conversation or any other conversation after that. So that's my number one issue when it comes to refreshing Congress. And the idea that we also take a look at the gerrymandering that occurs, the partisan redistricting, I think it's the most disgraceful thing any party leader or anybody in Congress could ever do to the democracy that we have, or at least the representative republic that we have, is to draw lines based on personal characteristics and then do so with each other's blessing to make sure that a certain district only goes Republican, only goes Democrat. It's a disgusting, disgusting practice I would like to see ended. And then lastly, of course, uh, democracy vouchers, which I talk about on the website a bit, and that's the idea of you giving uh, the 96 to 98 percent of the people who contribute nothing to politics and therefore, in my estimation, don't get much in return. They don't get public servants that serve them, because they're not contributing, they're not donating, and unfortunately candidates go where the money is. I want to put 50 bucks in the hands of every single citizen who pays taxes, a return on their taxes, so they can put it in the system, so they get attention from people running for office, and next thing you know, we're going to get a lot better laws that way. And then, obviously, there's a lot more in there, but to answer your question directly, the sunset clause is a, is a simple concept. 
every year we pass laws and legislation. It proposes to do certain things. It's creating this bureaucracy or this regulations, or whatever it's creating to fix a problem. It's, it gets passed, and then it's la and then we never look back at it again. We never go back to try to figure out if it's working, or how effective, or how efficient it is. The sunset clause pretty much says every law has to have a timeline to get reevaluated, and then the Congress reevaluates it and determines it's not worth going up for a vote again, guess what? We have less laws in the books. And it goes back to the idea I said of simplicity and competition. Less laws on the books means simplicity. The more simplicity we have, the more voters we have out there keeping a watch because they're not apathetic and disconnected. And that's what we need. So the Sunset Clause gets us there. Those other three things I talked about helps get us there as well. Well, this is, a, this, and no pun intended, this is um, refreshing. Um, and uh, so uh, <laughs> now uh, this is the kind of ideas we're going to have when um, we have an independence in there. Um, I mean, it's. I mean, I hopefully other states are thinking the same thing. And imagine if we all had fifty dollars to contribute to whoever we wanted. I mean, if you only had like in the beginning like a million um, people who were behind your campaign, that would be fifty million dollars that you would have right now. So, um, so yeah, an excellent idea. It's called, it's, it's, it's called beating. Uh Corporate money with more money. It's a concept that uh, it's just recently getting it, uh, 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 out there in the press and people are talking about it. But before you ask me the next question, I just want to say one thing. We're talking about the idea of independence on the ballot, and even even me running as independent, it seems like, oh, it's such a long shot, right, because I study politics. I know the chances are slim. And even you, you're like, we need more independence. And we got listeners out there that are like, oh, independence never went. Well, let me tell you something. This is the year we need to make change happen. This is the year we need to support people like me and others who are running, not as a Republican or Democrat, but as independents or non-party affiliate members or as a third party for that matter. You need to get behind where your heart is. You need to get behind where you think this country needs to go. And keep voting in the same party servants, self-service, and special interest group servants is the problem, and you're not going to get the change you want. So stop talking about, oh, it can't happen, or, oh, it's wasted vote. Score voting will change that. Put me in office, and I will change that. I will do that. I will fill a buck your day one every bill until someone starts talking more about score voting. Actually, I take that back. I don't want to go out there on a, on a limb and say that I'm going to fill a buck every bill and seem like I'm going to be someone causing havoc out there. But that's how passionate I am about this. Well, you're I just want to see more public service. Yeah, you're going to represent us, um, and, and that's what I hear. And um, I, I think people listening, I mean, here's a real genuine, sincere person um, who's capable, and I think, you know, I'm going to get behind you, Chris, um, and I think it's just the common sense thing to do. Uh, if you care about the country, that's um, my opinion here. Now, as well, um, let's look at here. Uh, I'm looking at a poll here um, that Congress right now, has 17% approval rate rating, 1-7, 17% approval rating, and that's up. I mean, back a couple months ago, it was down in the single digits, and it kind of fluctuates between that. Um, that, I mean, um, that's a Gallup poll uh, uh, this year. Uh, you can Google that. That's verified fact, and, and the media is not much higher than that, but luckily we can do some interviews here, and, uh, and I hope you do get some big uh, media, Chris, I, I really do, um, and, uh, and in the debates. Um, now, just real quick before we end with the vision here, um, like what your vision is, I just want to just um, just say some words and, and, um, and see what you think about them, like, you know, just like a sentence or something like that, if that's okay with you. Sure. Okay, it's just kind of fun. I've seen on a lot of interviews. So, how about uh, the Federal Reserve? Audit. Okay, uh, Social Security. Not as bad as people think. A little change here, a little change there. We can make it work. Okay, great. I think that's what a lot of people want to hear. Like, so they're kind of have to choose a Republican who's going to get rid of it, or Democrats who's going to do other things that they disagree with. Now we can have a real choice here. And um, what do you think about a public option for health care? At the state level, sure. At the federal level, I'd. I'd, I'd Okay, you 50 know, laboratories of freedom. I think that's a good way of looking at it, right? Uh, there you go. There you go. Yep. Um, uh, we already covered trade policy. Um, what do you think of the fair tax, um, just the sales tax? Probably the most uh, efficient means of collecting taxes is by way of consumption. Unfortunately, we're a long way away from making that dramatic of a change to our system. I, I, uh, I, don't, uh, I don't champion it, but I champion the ideals of it. Okay, great. And that's kind of like what we have in Florida, and it works pretty well. Um, uh, industrial hemp. 
no problem with hemp. I have no problem with uh, decriminalization of marijuana. I think, frankly, our drug war is uh, too costly and uh, we need to end it. And 50 <laughs> percent, actually, 50 percent of people who agree with you there, um, and uh, probably even more. And do you know what? Um, uh, even the people that might disagree, they probably don't agree that there should be, you know, harsh penalties for it, though. So. Uh, look, the, the kind of problems we have out there, the symptoms we have out there with addiction and, 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 and unfortunately, uh, people getting harmed or harming others uh, is, is, is minimal. But it's worth paying attention to and the idea that they need to be locked up or thrown into a prison system and then, unfortunately, uh, coming out and probably returning to it and costing taxpayers thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a year in the process and ruining families. No, 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 no. If there's an issue that someone can't uh, seem to let go of a, a specific uh, substance uh, that we decriminalize, it's a health care issue, in my opinion, and something we need to address as an addiction uh, in that system, not the prison system. Well, Chris, I appreciate you not playing politics with this issue, and, and that's great. Um, what about no-bid contracts? Not, uh, I'm not too sure with where you're going with that, no big contracts. Obviously, the idea that anybody in the federal government would offer a contract to somebody with, without first getting bids from other people, I'm sure it happens, but I, I don't know a lot of people making a big deal out of that except to say, if it did happen, I would be against it 100%. Okay, and uh, uh, Veterans Administration. As a veteran, veterans are very important to me. The idea that we serve uh, our country in a time of war or not, uh, the idea that we go out there and, uh, and, and provide for veterans is something I support. I don't, uh, I, don't, uh, I don't pretend to be the military candidate who will always do whatever's right uh, in terms of the military industrial complex and the idea that we have acquisitions and we give no big contracts, I guess, to your previous question. Uh, but I most certainly will do whatever's right for the service member and woman. Uh, who goes out there and serves uh, ever wears a uniform without a doubt. Yeah, I think you no know, matter, even the far, far libertarians, you know, would agree with that, right? And um, and that's good to know. Uh, NASA. Wow, you're, you're hitting uh, home there. A lot of people have a lot of strong feelings about uh, NASA. I'm one of those uh, people who want to cut the budget in a lot of areas, but definitely want to see research and development, not only at our current budget levels, but at uh, inflated or even, you know, more, more money towards research and development, not so much so it can go to private industry, but so Americans can keep innovating and giving us uh, some of the innovations of the past, to include the internet or asphalt or uh, whatever it may be that comes from these groups, these, these bodies of, uh, of government sponsored, or in this case, NASA, sure, uh, let's fund them. Great, great, and uh, internet privacy. Internet is probably one of the most passionate issues I have outside of the three that we talked about. Uh, the idea that we would uh, have this functioning system called the Internet that has provided so many jobs and spurred the economy in so many different ways. It gives someone like me a voice, a chance uh, in, a, in our representative republic. It gives entrepreneurs uh, vision, idea, growth, risk is taken because of the Internet. The idea that we would circumvent anything that's going on right now on the Internet is is, is, with SOPA or PIPA or any other laws that, that, uh, that prevent innovation or, or would cripple the economy that known as the Internet, I, I think that's laughable and something I would fight very, very hard. Yeah, that's for crazy that. talk. Yeah, that's for sure. You're absolutely right about that. And um, what about um, the, the Constitution? Carried every day for the last six years. Um, it's pretty beaten up, <laughs> but I love it. Uh, I can't say that I... I uh, I, uh, I read it every day, but I definitely care it every day, and uh, I, I think that what we should go to Washington and do is serve that. that that's the document that we, we, we should be pledging to. No other group, no other special interest group, uh, no other document, in my opinion, even. No other anything besides the Constitution. So uh, following that is pretty straightforward and simple, basing my whole campaign on the idea that if I'm going to serve all Americans, that basically means that, sure, I might want to do something because I'm passionate uh, or emotional or I want to give and provide, uh, but unfortunately, if the Constitution doesn't allow it, then I'm interjecting my own personal opinions, and that's where we have a problem in politics. People don't do what is right. They do what they uh, feel uh, in, 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 in the case of deviating from liberty or the Constitution and providing health care for everyone. I, sure, it would be great. I wish everyone had free health care, but unfortunately, when you start doing what you think everyone should have as opposed to what the Constitution says, 
that's where we get into problems. So U.S. Constitution all the way. All right, just two more. Um, the Patriot Act. That's an interesting one. Uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of law in there that changes and, and uh, gets a lot of people excited because one way or the other it might get your library database or it might set up a whole bureaucracy and institution that can spy on you and collect data on you all in the name of fighting terrorism but then use it for other things, other, other uh, aspects of government where they think you should or should not be doing something. And it's tricky. Uh, when you tell the American people that we haven't been attacked in 10 years, they're going to look at something like the Patriot Act and give credit to that and the Bush administration, the Obama administration, the idea that we're fighting terrorism as tough as we are. And you take away those type of rules, those type of laws, those type of legislation, and uh, you're going to gain more freedoms and you're going to get back to the U.S. Constitution, which is why I'm for the repeal of the Patriot Act. But I'm not going out there in this campaign and saying that uh, that's my number one issue or even my number two or number three. Right, right. And I think the uh, sunset type of provisions could could help alleviate some of that, too, and also making sure that, um, you know, um, that, that well, that one probably needs a complete review. But so the last issue here, sir, is uh, Florida oil drilling. Well, what off the coast you're talking about? Yeah, you, you know, um, well, you know, it's kind of an issue with Florida. Um, yeah, so off the, like off, you know, within a certain amount of space, like do you think they should be able to drill closer than they are able to now off the coast? Of uh, it's, not, it's another one of those issues that I don't highlight extensively on my campaign, so I don't feel comfortable speaking extensively about it, but I will tell you from, in, in the outset that I know that our economy here in Florida throughout the entire state is based heavily on tourism, and once you start jeopardizing a whole state's economy by putting out uh, wells or, or tapping into oil outside of uh, the Gulf, especially with the recent instances that have occurred, I'd, I'd, I definitely would give someone like me pause, even though I believe in capitalism and the free market and the idea that uh, extracting energy home saves us from having to send money overseas and ultimately sometimes in the hands of people we don't want to have our resources in the hands of. Uh, that that would that would be something that would give me pause. Yeah, that kind of has a balance there. Um, and you know what? One issue I did forget about, um, but um, it, it's and I don't think it's one of those issues like that is one of the big issues per se. But abortion. Do you have any opinion on that? Abortion. I know a lot of people are really passionate about abortion as well as gun control or, or, or gays marrying. And when it comes to social issues or anything outside of uh, the scope of what we talked about today, even though I have my own personal stances, I don't think the government should go out there and be mandating uh, one way or the other outside of what the Constitution says. So, uh, no, I, I don't take a, I don't take a, uh, a strong stance on social uh, moral values. I say that our society is better when everyone is uh, acting decently, and unfortunately we have situations where out of our control, who am I to tell a woman who, uh, who might want to take that, uh, that option, that I'm going to take that option away from her as a government. Uh, I, it's, I, right. Again, one of those things. Yeah, and, and some people, when they say they're against it, they're not quite considering, you, you know, the life of the mother and, and incest and rape and some of those issues. I wish they would clarify even when they're talking about those issues, like more specifically in what situations. But that's a hot topic. Just wanted. To, it's a hot topic. I know and, other and people, people will probably would be wondering about that. You know, for sure, some sure. A lot of people want to know about that. They want to know about uh, the more the personal stuff, the personal. Uh, uh, be it religion or be it uh, uh, gays, I support gay marriage. Uh, I don't support uh, 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 preventing a woman's choice. I, I basically goes back to what we talked about earlier. You don't take choice away from people. Now, do I think that the federal government should be paying for anyone's abortion? God, no, of course not. We need to maintain that and then strengthen that so law. That's and make a good sure that point to happen. make too. Yeah. So we're not going to use tax dollar funds for it. And so that's, I think, pretty much the status quo. And until we've solved these bigger issues with the deficit and our foreign policy and and some of the, you know, our just our economy in general. And um, now. Um, it's uh, the Second Amendment. You said you supported someone's right to, to bear arms. Is that correct? Sure, of course. Okay. Yeah, no. yeah, yeah. Um, Now, uh, do you have, um, just out of curiosity, do you have a favorite ex-president or politician? <laughs> uh, I've been asked that a few times. Look, they, they all have a lot of uh, attributes and qualities, the ones that I've studied that I like. Obviously, the one that I 
I go to uh, as my favorite is the one who's not affiliated with a Republican or Democrat party, and that would be George Washington, the idea that we have our first president who denied becoming king or maintaining that position for any length of time outside of two terms is another reason why uh, setting so many precedents, uh, leading soldiers at a time of war, George Washington is it, hands down. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a that's a good answer. And um, wow, Chris, uh, I, yeah, this has been uh, I, I think an amazing interview. Um, now, also, just finally, just uh, w you know, a lot of people say like you know you can have issues and stuff, but what about a vision? I mean, can you present people a vision? Can you imagine like you know we had there's so many Hollywood movies that come out that you know all the future seems like you, you know we're tracked and traced and it's all mil militaristic and it's like aliens and all this kind of stuff. Um, except maybe the Jetsons, you know, but besides that, can you, like, if we elected more independents, let's say we elected a whole house full of independents that had the same ideas, like, pretty much that you did, or they could have various ideas, but they could, you know, discuss them and, and work things out. Well, I mean, how could, what, what is your vision, sir? Well, if we're going to end this uh, conversation with a vision, I'm going, to, I'm going to do so as short and concise as possible to emphasize my vision of, you know, ensuring simplicity and competition. It comes down to a simple fact that money should influence outcomes either in campaigns or in legislation. And uh, the idea that when we elect leaders, they don't serve subsets of Americans. They serve America and under the U.S. Constitution. They do what is right for all Americans. That's my vision. That's what I'm fighting for. That's what I'd like to see more leaders in Washington doing. And uh, the laws that I propose, the, the, the things I champion, the passions I have, the things we talk about in this conversation, I think will get us there. Great, great. And um, that, that's it. Um, he means business. And um, so, Chris, thank you very much again. It was a pleasure. I'll be out there on the campaign. Um, I'll just say goodbye to you right after the interview. But um, uh, thank you very much. I think uh, the, the, the you know, there's a lot of information. You can go to chrisborgia.com, um, and that's where they can find the best information. Is there any other places uh, that you would suggest, Chris? That's the only place out there right now. We're going to get our Twitter page kicked off here in a little bit, or a little bit more Twitter action, I should say, and a lot more Facebook action. But otherwise, uh, and most of it's going to reside on the website. Thanks yes. again, Thomas. Yeah, and um, so people that want to interview him, contact him there. Um, people that have, you know, groups together, whether you're in your VFW meeting or you're in your, you know, Ron Paul meetups or, or wherever you are, uh, try to contact him if you have a radio station, etc. Thank you very much, Chris. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, Tom.